beginning in about the mid 80s, when my children were young and continuing to the present day, there has been a popular set of toys known as Transformers. Does anyone remember Transformers? Okay, so these ingenious little gizmos look like any average robot alien creature, but with a practice pull, twist, flip, and click, which frankly I could never master, small fingers can transform them into a car or a tank or a flying killer attack weapon. And wheels and wings and guns are cleverly hidden inside the robot bodies of those toys, giving them a dual identity. And then, of course, there's a whole film um, franchise that emerged out of those as well. So even I know about Bumblebee. Amen. So fascinated by the toy's ability to change before their very eyes, kids made these Transformers extremely popular. Now move ahead just a couple of years into the summer of 1991 and the release of yet another Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, Terminator 2, or T2 as it became to be known. And all of the characters from the original futuristic sci-fi run for your life movie were there, but with one important difference. Schwarzenegger's character, the Terminator, had been transformed, or in this case, reprogrammed into a kind of guardian angel for the ever-pursued woman and child. Now, other equally death-dealing villains awaited the protagonists, but the good guys were immeasurably aided by the protection and guidance of the former enemy. The Schwarzenegger droid had threateningly vowed, I'll be back at the conclusion of the first Terminator movie, and his promise is fulfilled in this movie, but in a totally unexpected manner, because he returns as the good guy. And I couldn't help but think of Transformers and the Terminator as illustrations of what it must have been like for Paul and Ananias to experience the transforming grace and forgiveness of Christ in our scripture story today. If ever there was a Terminator-like character in the Bible, it had to be Saul. He had enthusiastically earned his way onto the church's greatest enemies list. Accordingly, when Ananias hears that Saul is headed for Damascus, he expects nothing less than the worst, a nightmare a horror, even a holocaust. And yet what we discover is that both men are transformed from the inside out. Saul, through his encounter with the living Christ on the road, spins 180 degrees in his life orientation. The bitter well of self-righteousness from which he had been drawing his sustenance is sort of sweetened by Christ's touch, and it's changed into an eternal spring of love and dedication. Ananias' fear and loathing of his persecutor is also changed by Christ's words into an openness and acceptance of a true brother in the faith. I think part of what children find so fascinating about those Transformers is that the robot aliens usually change from a body-shaped creature into some kind of vehicle. And Christ's transforming love empowers us in the same way. We become vehicles for that love. And like Saul, we are charged with carrying out Christ the good news into the world. You see, under the power of Christ's love, Saul becomes the Apostle Paul, perhaps the single most influential figure in all of church history. And his story of transformation begins right here in the story of Saul and his subsequent meeting with the man we know as Ananias. It's a pretty dramatic event, etched indelibly forever 
into Christian consciousness. I think Paul tells it three or four times in the different letters and stories that he writes throughout the church. So we know that he was Saul of Tarsus, one of the church's first and fiercest foes. He was a devout Pharisee, which was a religious party within first century Judaism. And he was convinced that these Christians were a dangerous fringe movement in Judaism, that they would irreplaceably damage Judaism with their dangerous innovation, their claims that Jesus is the Messiah. And so Saul persecuted Christians. Saul was on Damascus with official letters from the authorities, giving him the power to seek out and destroy Christian groups there. And on his way, we read, there was a light and a voice. Saul, Saul, why are you doing this to me? Or in other translations, why do you persecute me? And he fell to the ground, blinded by the light. And now I know from Luke, it's because he was looking up into the sun. The things we learn from children, the voice was from the risen Christ. So Saul is stunned, blinded, and he has to be led around by the hand. He doesn't eat or drink. And friends, during that time, he is moved from one way of being to another. And in the middle of this dramatic, traumatic story of change, this man appears. We know him by the name Ananias. And Saul is then led off by the, hand, by the hand by his companions who can't imagine what has happened to him. They saw the light, but they didn't hear the voice, so they're just trusting what Saul has told them happened. They know he cannot eat or drink, and he can't find his way around by himself. We read later in the story, the voice of God comes to Ananias and says, Ananias, arise and go to the street called Straight. There you will meet a man named Saul. Go and welcome him into the faith because I have got plans for him. I have chosen him to be my missionary to the Gentiles. Imagine being Ananias. He can hardly believe what he hears. Lord, did you say Saul? That same Saul that is church enemy number one? The persecutor and destroyer of so many Christians? And the voice replies, go. Now you got to give Ananias credit. He goes. He goes to Straight Street in Damascus, and there, just as the voice said, there's this man, Saul. And Ananias goes to him and addresses him not as church enemy number one, not as the murderer and destroyer that he is, but rather he addresses him as brother Saul. Ananias laid hands on him, and immediately Saul's sight is restored, and he is able to receive food. The change has been so dramatic that we read he is no longer called Saul, but gets a new name representative of his new identity. He will now be known as Paul. What if Ananias had said, Lord, I don't mind a little evangelism. I don't mind some new people joining our church, but a murderer? I am not going to wander down straight street and risk death on the basic basis of some guy's religious experience. I don't know about you. I wouldn't have blamed Ananias for that. I mean, maybe he had friends, close family members who had been put in prison or even put to death through the efforts of this Saul. I mean, maybe he didn't wish him any harm, but certainly he wouldn't wish him any good. And it's enough to make you ask, who had the most dramatic conversion in this story? Was it Saul, 
who was converted from being church enemy number one to the great missionary of the Gentiles, the one that we now know as Saint Paul? Or was it Ananias? Ananias who, on the basis of absolutely nothing but this voice and this vision, risked his life, went to the street called Straight, and addressed this once bitter enemy by the term brother, touched him, laid hands upon his head, and was thus the agent of transformation, one of the most dramatic transformations in all of Scripture. When we are truly converted to Christ, we are not simply converted into loving Christ, but in loving Christ, we are commanded to love those whom Christ loves. And his love, it's always reaching out, grasping hold of lives, changing others, bringing lost sheep into the fold. And if you're already in the fold, how does it feel when some of those lost sheep get found? It's one thing to love Jesus, but sometimes it can be an even greater challenge to love all who Christ loves. Ananias had heard enough of this man called Saul to know that he really didn't want to have any part of him. And yet, he was commanded to go to his house and bless him, commanded to call him by the name brother. Ken Miedema is a wonderful musician and singer. He is also blind. I first heard Ken at a National Youth Workers Convention back in the 90s. He still participates in those um, 30 years later. And few ever having heard Ken in concert ever forget his music and his witness. He's amazing. He will take whatever the speaker is saying, think about it with his own thoughts, put it to music, and then create a song on the spot and sing it back to those who are gathered. And so singing like that at a chapel service one evening, he told the students, I am a member of a Baptist church in California. At least we thought we were Baptist, but the convention has just told us that we've been bad, real bad. See, we thought we were, as Baptists, we were supposed to go out and baptize everybody we could get our hands on. So we were just baptizing and baptizing. And then some of the convention asked us, what did you go and baptize people like them for? And we said, well, we didn't know that Jesus wanted us to baptize some, but not all. And they said, you can't go being this close with people who love the way they love and have sex the way they have sex. And we said, well, we didn't know you had to have sex in a certain way to be baptized. Show us in the Bible where it says you have to have sex in a certain way to be Baptist. See, we Baptists are really big on the Bible, Miedemus said. Many of you may have heard that today marks the day when a group of people calling themselves the Global Methodist Church are planning to leave the United Methodist Church and form a new denomination based in great part on who it is okay or not okay to love. Several years ago here at Desert Skies, we had discussions around that topic and we came up with our statement of full inclusion. And we have decided as a church body that we will not make that determination, that God can handle that, but that like Ken Miedema, we will just keep inviting all people to participate in our ministries. All the people whom Jesus loves. And frankly, that isn't always easy. And maybe, maybe this is the acid test for whether or not you can call yourself a follower of the way. Are you able to call brother or sister those whom Jesus has so named, regardless of differences of opinion? Because we're not all on the same place on that particular issue. And that's okay. We're still brothers and sisters in Christ whether that is theological or ideological or political, 
Are you able to call each other brother and sister? Now note that Ananias is not, for all we know, some sort of spectacular Christian. We never hear him teach or preach. His name is not ever mentioned as one who is closest to Jesus, either before or after the resurrection. He's just this ordinary person. And so like Kira taught us, think of discipleship as the taking of ordinary, everyday people just like you and turning you into saints, courageous people who are able to relate to others in the same way that Jesus relates to you, ordinary people who live counter to the ways of the world, who gather together regardless of opinions about all sorts of things, who refer to other not by the world's designations of us and them, but by Ananias' as sister and brother. So what voices might we need to listen to, to hear the voice of Christ today? What voices might we have silenced in our certainty? What stories have been ignored in an age of shouting and anger? Do we know the Lord that we seek to follow? The one whose name we take and whose path we try to follow? That question, who are you, Lord, that Paul, Saul asked on the road to Damascus when he heard the Lord's voice, that is a question that we need to ask as fervently as the blinded, frightened Saul lying on the side of the road in Damascus. And how might the story of this dramatic call on a dusty road to Damascus give us a new imagination? At any time, has our zeal, like Saul's, been misdirected and even destructive? If there's one thing I know, it's that God will ask us to do difficult things and go in unexpected places. And God will use all of us, even our supposed enemies, those whom we disagree with vociferously, to do God's work in the world. So I invite us to keep our eyes open, to listen to the voices all around us, and let us determine together through conversation, through getting to know one another, through studying together, through witnessing to the love of God in Christ Jesus. Let us do that together. So our call might be ordinary people unite and be transformers. And all of God's people say, Amen.